Hello, I'm Julie Spino, um, uh, best of name, and I am a kindergarten through fourth grade Spanish teacher um, and have been lucky enough to also uh, teach Spanish to adults uh, as well as um, Russian and English as a second language. Um, Today in this presentation, I uh, would like to share with you uh, some insights that I have had um, as I have taken uh, a look at um, my current student population and what my kiddos are bringing to the classroom uh, in terms of challenges uh, and other issues that have an impact on how we teach and how we create our class community. And so um, in the process of doing some research and learning more about what types of challenges uh, kiddos are bringing to the classroom, um, I uh, came up with the, for lack of a better phrase, the Calm Classroom, uh, which featured uh, as part of my keynote address uh, during the Nell Summer Institute of 2018. And since I've been able to share that um, locally um, in the state of Maine, and then at um, NECTFEL uh, this February uh, 2020. Uh, so I'd like to share the screen and that will give you uh, some information as I walk through that for you. Uh, if you give me one second. Okay. Uh, so be the calm classroom. Uh, there's some uh, interesting uh, information out there. Um, that we um, that I have learned uh, from doing my reading about um, students and the types of challenges that they are bringing uh, to our classroom. And uh, for those of you who have been uh, in the teaching profession for a fair amount of time, you certainly uh, are aware, I think, uh, of the changing population, um, or rather, uh, the challenges that kids are bringing today. Um, this is my twenty-sixth. Uh, year teaching and I can definitely say that I see more kids coming um, with uh, a variety of issues that has certainly had an impact on how I teach and how I uh, create my classroom community. So let's just look at a couple of statistics that I shared um, in my presentation um, in person and then I will give you some examples of how you can create what I call the clown classroom. So if we look here, uh, these are a couple of sobering statistics. Uh, so one in seven incoming kindergartners has significant anxiety. Uh, and what this means is anxiety that really intrudes upon and makes it more difficult for that student uh, to be successful uh, or and or to um, be able to function um, really well um, in, and positively productively uh, in a classroom setting. And, potentially in other settings as well. Um, also, one in four incoming kindergartners has suffered trauma. Um, this is a statistic that uh, ha uh, comes from um, testing on 10 different indicators for trauma. Um, and this rises to one in three by the time they are aged 14 to 17. So both of these issues coupled with some other uh, challenges that students bring to our classroom, such as ADHD, uh, which is um, according to some reading that I have done, uh, is on the rise. Uh, and also other factors um, that uh, have to do with environment, that have to do with how um, kids present, um, those have definitely increased uh, the challenge. And one of the things that I find really interesting as part of my rationale um, and knowing these statistics um, and where um, some of my thinking around how I came to the Calm Classroom is that if we think about our students and we think about these challenges that they are uh, coming to our classrooms with and we think about what traditionally um, or certainly over the past I would say 10-15 years uh, in terms of our thinking as educators we've really uh, focused a lot on 
um, high energy, uh, what we call at the elementary school, you know, getting the wiggles out, um, and sometimes uh, creating a lot of movement and um, high energy, as I said, in our classroom. And the interesting piece around that is that for our kids with challenges such as anxiety, um, trauma, which may present with anxiety, um, ADHD, uh, some of our other issues, um, we have a uh, a fair number of kids, I think, on the rise around having um, a low tolerance for frustration, a low tolerance for risk. Um, those kids sometimes do not actually benefit from a high energy, high movement, um, lots of stimulation um, type classroom. And for some of those kids, in fact, it can really be detrimental. Uh, it can feel very unsafe uh, if they're, again, uh, so if, for example, students with anxiety um, or with trauma may find that that amount of uh, stimulus is really, really hard for them to manage. So I am... Uh, going to say that I am not uh, recommending that we get rid of those activities altogether, uh, but rather that um, how can we think about different ways to approach our classroom? How can we think of ways that perhaps balance out uh, some of those higher energy or um, in some instances, perhaps chaotic uh, types of activities? How can we balance those out to be sure that we are also thinking about our kids who are presenting with some of these other uh, challenges. So, again, as I said, I call this um, being the calm classroom. And again, balancing those energetic activities with quieter ones uh, that take into consideration some of the issues that our kids are presenting with in our classrooms. So, what might those be? Um, so I think about this in terms of a peaceful space. Um, I have had a number of my students um, actually give me feedback to say that when we are doing these calming or quieter activities or creating this more peaceful space, um, I'm, I have kids tell me that it is the only time in the day where they are experiencing that and um, that they enjoy it and that they crave it, uh, which I find really interesting. You know, if we think about um, your average kid's life, they get up in the morning and they're kind of on the go uh, all through the day because we are not the only educators as world language teachers. We are not the only ones who are thinking about movement and activity and the high stimulus, right? So all through their day, they're um, experiencing that. They're also experiencing a number of transitions, um, movement, that type of thing. And then of course, uh, many of them might be involved in after school activities um, and then they get home and you know there's some bustle around that before they finally go to bed. Uh, so you can imagine um, unless a family is really intentional around creating some some quiet uh, in the home a kid could potentially be really uh, in active movement for much if not all of the day. So um, here are some strategies that can work. And I really uh, <laughs> am thinking too in terms of uh, what this will look like in a remote setting, uh, given that we are certainly in the time of COVID and um, we may or may not be entirely online, uh, but certainly even if we are uh, partially remote, what can this look like? So the first strategy is uh, having your lights off uh, or creating mood lighting. So if you are in your classroom, uh, one of the things, um, or even if you are a traveling teacher uh, on a cart, I was on a cart for 13 years, so I can fully um, sympathize with that. Um, lights off and, and, and or mood lighting can really uh, allow us that opportunity um, by leveraging what happens naturally when lights are off or if there's soft lighting in the room. It allows us to calm down um, naturally. And so if we are trying to create an atmosphere, a feeling of calm, uh, this is one great way to do that. Uh, if you are on a cart and you are going into someone else's classroom, uh, you may not be able to have the lights off when you walk in, but you could certainly turn the lights off when you get in there. 
Uh, when I think about this for remote learning, I do find that this would might be challenging, but for example, you could create a background right uh, that creates an atmosphere of calm so you might uh, choose a background on your zoom setting um, that has a very peaceful feel um, or is you know somewhat muted uh, to give that feeling that uh, to replicate what it might feel like um, in the classroom it is certainly not um, the same um, but hopefully I would have a similar feel Another uh, strategy that I find can be very effective is quiet voices, right? And I think we as teachers, uh, we naturally tend to project our voice. We are trying to uh, address our entire classroom. There's a big space. And so, of course, we are trying to uh, ensure that everyone can hear us. Uh, but sometimes, uh, using a quiet voice, especially coupled with lights off or mood lighting, can really, again, leverage that idea of bringing us down naturally in terms of feeling calmer, feeling more peaceful, uh, feeling um, just a little bit less agitated. And I think that um, it also sends a really soft signal uh, to our students, uh, sometimes um, we may unintentionally project an emotion through uh, the tenor or loudness of our voice that we don't mean to actually do. And so sometimes modulating downward, keeping that nice and quiet also um, has the effect of um, reassuring our students and I will say that for myself personally, I do find that when I use a quieter voice, I am calmer. And I, I uh, would definitely have to say that us being calm is as important to creating that calm environment as the activities that we actually do. And sometimes that can be um, challenging, but some of these will just naturally calm us down. Um, in fact, all of them will. Uh, so the really good strategies I've had teachers uh, give me feedback to say that uh, these have been really effective for them in terms of helping them calm down, uh, especially for those of us who transition through many classes uh, during a day, it can be really, really hard to find those those moments where we ourselves uh, can take a moment to breathe. Let's look at another strategy. Um, so these three, yoga, brain gym, and tai chi, are all uh, strategies that involve very intentional movement. And I think that that's really, really important, especially for young children. Uh, I am seeing more and more uh, students who really struggle um, with self-control in terms of both, of course, their voices, <laughs> but also their bodies. They have a really hard time. They haven't developed that. Um, and I definitely, as I said, I see more of that than I used to. So... But having a body that is in control is really safe. It is really important for the safety of your entire classroom, right? And if we go back to those kids who are anxious or those kids um, who have experienced trauma in particular, other children in the classroom who are bodily out of control, who are encroaching upon their self, um, uh, on their personal space, that can feel really unsafe. So. Controlled movement, and by controlled movement, I mean intentional movement, right? Thoughtful movement can be beneficial, um, both in terms of the kids who need to learn how to do that, but also um, it has that greater effect around the entire classroom. So there are three different ones here. Uh, I would say most people um, are, I would say people are most familiar with yoga, right? You can start a class with a yoga pose uh, or two or three. Um, I uh, have, uh, for the last couple of years at least, yeah, um, 
had certain classes that come right after lunch. So the kids are very much agitated. They've come from a very unstructured location and it's very hard for them to transition back into the classroom. Uh, I see the same thing when I have kids come in after recess. Again, there's, you know, that level of energy that needs an outlet uh, or needs some um, transitioning, right? And I find that guided transitioning to help bring them down to refocus is really, really helpful. So yoga is one of those activities that we could choose uh, to help kids as they transition, right? And it goes back to that idea of intentional movement. Uh, a yoga pose, you have to be in a particular pose, right? Your arms have to be in a particular place. Your body has to be in a particular place. If you transition into another um, pose, you do that with intention. You do that uh, slowly. And so you have to control your muscles. And the same with Tai Chi. Again, you are controlling your muscles um, as you make these intentional movements. And so that teaches children, especially if they practice this on a regular basis, it teaches them self-control and it allows their muscles to develop that knowledge, right? So the more their muscles practice, they build muscle memory around what it means to be in control as a body. Um, as I mentioned, so I'm having kids come from lunch, for example, so they might walk in, I might have the lights off, I'm speaking quietly, and I might pull out a yoga card, and I um, will go right into that pose, or I might have a video of a yoga pose that we can do together. Um, and then we'll just hold that, we might only do two poses, we might only do one pose, uh, dependent on uh, the activity. Uh, depending, excuse me, on my plans for the rest of class. And also depending on my students. Uh, some classes you know, need this more than others. Brain gym is uh, a set of um, movement activities, again, with great intention. But what I love about brain gym on top of, or in addition to yoga or Tai Chi, is that it is specifically designed to help your brain focus by crossing the midline. Many of the um, brain gym activities cross the midline, which has been shown to activate the brain to allow for focus, which I uh, really, really appreciate. Um, when I'm giving this presentation, um, I uh, will demonstrate um, some of these that I do with kids. Um, and one of them, I will just show you quickly. Um, but the idea is that you're going to cross your arms, link your hands. So now you see they're crossing the midline. And then you bring it up like this and you hold it. And perhaps you breathe for 10 seconds. You might count softly. Um, so integrating those quiet voices along with um, the brain gym. And because this crosses the midline, it allows our students uh, to activate their brain, the calming down, uh, and then they can unlink. Uh, brain gym has a number of uh, activities. You can do a search on uh, YouTube. Uh, to find uh, specific ones and what uh, they are meant for. And of course you can go to their website. Um, all of these are, if you are in a remote setting, you can easily start your remote class uh, via Zoom, for example, with one of these or more than one of these activities. Uh, so though we might feel that they're um, most effective in a live setting, um, they are just as easy actually to do for, uh, via a, a Zoom um, uh, interaction. You just want to make sure that you know, you're far enough back that they can see what you are doing. Okay, um, we have a couple more that I want to share with you. Uh, these two, mindfulness and breathing, uh, are somewhat separate uh, but can be integrated together. Um, mindfulness, of course, is that idea of allowing your brain uh, some space, some peace, um, perhaps guided meditation uh, to really kind of allow 
of some rest um, with your brain. One thing that I think can be really neat with um, mindfulness is if you use the target language, you use visuals to set a scene that you then walk your kids through, uh, kind of like a guided uh, meditation. Uh, for example, um, with my kindergartners, uh, I might have the lights out and I um, might uh, have them picture um, the stars or the moon and we um, pretend like we're taking a nap, like we're going to sleep. I keep it really, really simple. I don't need a lot of target language to be able to do it. And we calm down um, a, a bit like, if you think about it with little kids, it's a lot like imaginative play right but you're purposely choosing imaginative play um, that has a common effect right or we're going to walk through a forest think about what you see what do you hear what do you smell uh, what do you feel right um, so you're giving them that um, space in order to be able to visualize that um, breathing and breathing exercises is something that I have, um, I'm very new to uh, this past year. Um, I had integrated it with yoga um, and brain gym, but I really hadn't thought about it as an activity in and of itself until um, one of our uh, other teachers was using um, breathing mats in um at lunchtime in order to help our kids who were really agitated you know, again lunch is uh, definitely a very unstructured location it can be very very hard for kids um started using breathing mats uh, with uh, infinity loops um that allow kids to concentrate and follow an infinity loop um, while they're breathing. So putting up a little timer and then having kids just breathe in and breathe out, breathe in and breathe out. Um, I discovered that this was really, really helpful. I made my own um, and I'll, I'll mention those again in a moment. Um, and I had them out um, on all my tables uh, around my classroom this past year, as well as in my take a break space. And um, that was a strategy that any kid at any time could go and um, just use the breathing loop, right? And allow themselves to self-select, uh, to calm down, uh, to use those breathing to refocus, to certainly go out um, into the take a break space and do that as well. And I ended up finding that to be really, really effective. Um, I would suggest if you're in a remote setting, you could send those breathing loops home or have kids make an infinity loop at home that you could all then do together at the beginning of class if you wanted to, you know, maybe mix things up. Um, with yoga, brain gym, breathing. Um, I like to keep things very routine, uh, but sometimes, you know, we might need, or if you're having a, a longer Zoom session, maybe uh, you break in the middle to do a breathing activity, or you make, perhaps you have done a high energy or a, a really high focus activity, and you want kids to just kind of uh, have some space um, to recenter before they move on. Uh, certainly a breathing loop would be a, uh, a great um, option. Relaxation music and videos. Uh, these are fantastic for setting the mood. Um, there are a number of them uh, on YouTube uh, that are designed specifically uh, for calming um, oneself. Uh, perhaps you've you know seen those videos um, or have heard those CDs with ocean sounds uh, or you know rainforest sounds or a babbling brook that type of thing. Uh, so I like to have those in my classroom. I have you know the big um, uh, whiteboard um, smart board and so I might just have one of those up uh, behind me while I am teaching um, especially if kids are you know at their tables and they're doing something independently this is a really great thing to have on in the background lights off 
soft uh, music or soft video in the background uh, can really contribute to that calm classroom. There are also some um, that feature locations um, around the world um, that would connect with our target language cultures. And so those are a really neat thing to put um, in back of you uh, because then you can connect uh, both in terms of um, that calm classroom, but you're also integrating some culture uh, at the same time. Uh, the same could be said, for example, sometimes uh, my fourth graders this year, I did uh, a number of times, I just played Spanish guitar, uh, flamenco, uh, but very relaxing flamenco in the background. And that was also very successful. My kids really, really uh, loved that. And in fact, would ask me for it again and again. Uh, so that can be a really great um, source uh, of um, or strategy to use in your class to calm down. Again, you're leveraging something that's already created specifically um, to be calm. And speaking of leveraging things that we uh, want to, uh, that are used specifically to calm, uh, lullabies are the last thing that I will uh, share today. Um, lullabies obviously are created, right, are sung to small children to help them fall asleep. So they are very soft. They're very calming in and of themselves. And so they're a fantastic way um, to harness something that's already there um, in existence um, to calm students. What I also love about lullabies, of course, is that they're authentic. So you're able to share some authentic culture with your students. Uh, I really uh, love, uh, there's one in particular, the lechusa, uh, that I use a lot in my classroom, both just specifically as a calming activity, uh, but I also use it um, as a transition, if we are doing something a little bit intense that I might use that or, you know, something that might be a little bit more high um, energy, I use that uh, as a transition to calm ourselves down as we transition into another activity. Again, uh, relaxation music, lullabies, those can be done in a remote setting as well. You leading them as uh, someone on Zoom, um, you're leading those activities. Uh, you could put the relaxation music up in the background um, or share your screen uh, with one of those videos uh, as a calming activity for your students. So lastly, I will just say before I say goodbye, um, you can find more information about all of these activities along with some links um, and um, a number of posts actually on my blog, uh, mundotepepita.com. Um, there are a ton of links for um, relaxation videos, how to use, um, how to do some of these other activities, as well as one post specifically called Be the Calm Classroom, uh, which flesh flushes out some of these uh, ideas in greater detail for you. So I hope that this has been helpful. I hope this has been useful. And I really appreciate you joining in and I hope to see you uh, online or uh, in another conference um, in the future. Thanks and bye.